and I'm just going to start letting everyone in. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. We're just letting everyone in from the waiting room. So we'll have a couple of minutes while everyone arrives. Feel free to start saying hi in the chat. Take the opportunity for a bit of peer networking. We'll make a start in a minute once people have had a chance to arrive. Okay, hi everyone. Hi to those of you who've just popped in from the waiting room. Just give everyone a minute to join us for those people that are joining us live today. If you wanna just get started by saying hi in the comments, take the opportunity for a bit of networking, see if you're down the road from someone. Just gonna keep letting people in and then we'll get started. We'll go to two minutes past and then I'll, I'll make a start. Okay, I'm just gonna keep letting people come in as they arrive. Thanks for introducing yourself in the chat. There should be the option to enable closed captions if you need them. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, welcome to Discussion Day, Small Charity Week 2023. Um, we've already had lots of really great sessions on over the last couple of days. Uh, thank you if you've been to one already. I think I can see someone at least who's delivered one already, delivered a session. Um, good to see you back. We've got more coming up. Um, tomorrow in particular is a big learning day, lots of really great free content that's available to book up until 5pm today. Um, there's a great session on innovative fundraising, um, how to do comms on a budget. Um, on Friday, we've got another discussion on the future of small charities, the future of infrastructure support for the sector, and a great session on financial planning. So do take a look at the website if you uh, have a, a few spare 45 minute slots in the rest of your week. Um, and if you don't, everything is going to be recorded. So you'll be able to catch up on all of the content <clears throat> throughout the week um, as we start to upload those recordings to the Small Charity Week website. So my name's Vic. I'm one of the team working on Small Charity Week this week with my colleagues, Wayne and Nicola, um, with support from NCVO and funding from Lloyds Bank Foundation. Um, and I'm joined today by Holly Riley from the Charity Commission, who I will let introduce herself. Um, but we're here to talk about the, the role of the Charity Commission in supporting smaller organisations. So we're going to hear from Holly on what the Commission is there for, what it does at the minute, what plans it's got going forward, and then we'll open the floor to some discussion to have some, some, some talk, some questions on perhaps how the Commission could better support smaller organisations, how they can be listening to the voice of the small charity sector to understand what it is that, that we feel we need. So um, I'm going to hand over to Holly to introduce herself. Uh, thank you, Holly. Thanks, Vic, and welcome everyone. It's really exciting to be here today. Um, so I'm Holly Riley. I'm the head 
head of policy at the Charity Commission. And as Vic said just today, to give a bit of an overview of the kind of things that we've got coming up and just to kind of have a discussion about uh, what we're doing and, and what else we should do, where the gaps are. So um, if we could kickstart Vic. Um, so yeah, what we will cover, so the role of the Charity Commission, um, what you can expect from us and what we can do more of. So uh, on the next slide, please, we'll start the role of the Charity Commission. Oh, and the next one, I put too many filler slides in clearly. Um, so I think one of the main things we often hear from people is that they genuinely don't know what we as the Charity Commission do. It's um, that we are the independent regulator of charities in England and Wales. So we are sort of linked to government, but entirely independent of government. We govern charities based on the outline of charity law, rather than kind of anything else. If if it is not in the Charities Act and various other pieces of legislation, uh, we can't do anything about it. So we have a very fixed remit. Um, we maintain the register, as uh, many of you will know, that kind of lists lots of information about charities and is a really important way of the public knowing about charities. And the register we know, as of yesterday, we are 169,072 charities uh, in England and Wales, with over 900,000 trustees and over 6 million volunteers, which is massive and obviously a huge amount of um, a massive sector to, for us to regulate and we do that in a variety of ways in terms of where the risk lies but also more where we can offer advice and support to charities. I think the important thing to also flag is that we are not the voice of the sector so um, we shouldn't, we do not speak for the sector, we do not um, lobby for the sector with government there are obviously other organizations that do that and i know that there's uh events going on throughout the week to discuss how small charities can get in there so while we have a role to play and we can uh inform government of things that would be beneficial to charities we are definitely not the voice of the sector um so next one please vic so what is coming up? So the idea here is just to give you a really whistle stop tour of some of the big things that you can expect to see from the Charity Commission in the next few months and over the next year. And then when we have the discussion, we can dive into some of these a little bit more. So we've started with my Charity Commission account. So this is the new IT system by which uh, all trustees will kind of have the relationship with the Charity Commission. So it will become a one-stop shop for all individual trustees and allow us to have a more proactive relationship. So at the moment, as you probably all know, charities have one login and really like people become trustees and they hear from us as the regulator. But then we don't really talk to you again unless you kind of break the law or you're late with your annual return or things like that. And my Charity Commission account, while it is very early days and we are just starting to onboard people and is very much a kind of front door at the minute, it's really exciting as it will allow us to have a more proactive relationship with trustees. So the idea being that instead of having to kind of search around for lots of different things, this will be a one stop shop with all the guidance all the information all the timetabling will be in there. But it will also allow us as the Commission to proactively send information. So if your charity has been registered, we know when that your annual returns due, when other information is due, that we can proactively send that out to you. But also uh, more useful information, sort of like how do you recruit trustees? What, what's the best way of doing those things? So hopefully this is over the next kind of two to five years, uh, a really, really exciting opportunity to really change the way we talk to trustees and gather trustees. So some of you may have received your login over the next few months. Uh, I'm a chair of a small charity. I did mine this morning. It is very quick and easy. So I would encourage everybody to get their login and uh, sign up. The next thing to do is around annual return 23. So obviously the annual return is core to most charities and how they interact with the commission. It's vital for us in knowing uh, what charities are doing. It's how we kind of do our risk basis and regulation, but also gives really important data on the sector. And in the past, questions have changed year on year, which we know has been really frustrating particularly for small charities when you're trying to do things in your spare time and this is not your day job and everything else. 
the idea of annual return 23 going onwards is that we won't be changing the questions as much. We have a bank of questions, so you will know what the questions will be year on year, which hopefully means it will be quicker and easier to fulfill your requirements on, in your annual return. The other thing to flag is around guidance, as you, most of you are probably aware of our offering of guidance and the fact that we're undertaking a programme of um, streamlining our guidance, making it easier, and, and that often comes in in our five minute guides. They do what they say on the tin, you should be able to read them within five minutes, and there's also videos accompanying them. At the minute, we have uh, just a small number, but then we know that they are the key, key things for charities. So it's sort of like if all else fails, know those and then you'll be in a good position to do that. And some of the other, so that programme will continue. We continue to update our guidance, making it easier, more streamlined to read. One of our recent ones, we reduced from 23,000 words down to 2,000 words. And that's obviously just better for everybody. You can understand it better and it's quicker. Um, I think one of the most eagerly awaited gu guidance pieces coming up will be our social media guidance, which we'll be publishing uh, in the summer. Um, when we did the consultation on it, we uh, either brilliantly or not brilliantly timed it with the whole Gary Lineker situation. So had lots of responses. So taking our time to get through it. But I think it's something that... Uh, charities are really aware of their responsibilities and keen to get it right and we're keen to help in that way um, and I think so research is the next one I've listed this is sort of a how can we be more useful and I'm interested to hear uh, your views when we open up for questions so we know from our research that 40% of trustees say they don't come to the commission for advice or guidance. We also know that there's a correlation between when trustees do read their guidance, they understand their requirements under law better. And so a lot of this research is interesting for us, but I'm not sure how interesting for the rest of the sector. We are currently undertaking a review of our research programme. And so we're interested in how we can make that data better for the sector to use. How can we help you tell your story? How can we understand what barriers there are to getting more trustees involved in, the, in your charity? So I think, as I say, whereas we've done, it's very useful to us, but we're able to ask questions of all that huge bank of trustees that, that I mentioned, the kind of 900,000 trustees. What would be useful for you for us to do that research almost on your behalf and to get that information out there. And that also links back to the My Charity Commission account that our hope is that we can do quick and real time polling of people. So when you log into your account, you have one pop up question you can click and we know things instantly. That could be game changing for the sector that we can talk to the sector, you can help us understand what we need to know and really get some kind of useful data going forward. And then I've thrown banking in as a, as a bottom one in that uh, we know that it is a massive issue out there. We know that it is uh, not working very well at the minute and that we are working closely with UK Finance. Uh, we were at the all party parliamentary group that NCVO organised yesterday uh, on the panel with them and UK Finance to try and put pressure on them to make a difference, to make it more straightforward. Uh, I'm unfortunately a, a living case study of this, having spent an hour on the phone to Barclays this morning about my own charity bank account. So it's uh, one close to my heart as well. But that, that one is more a kind of, we know we are listening, we are trying our best to kind of get some traction, but um, interested to sort of talk to people more about that. So say that is really a kind of whistle stop, high level flavor of some of the things that we are looking at over the next few months and, and happy to kind of talk to them more uh, as we go forward. And then the next part of the talk is what can we do more of? So we're currently undertaking a research project as part of the My Charity Commission account work where um, Strangely, for the first time, we are asking trustees, what do you want from us? So what can the Charity Commission do? And we're getting really useful data from that, from things that would make the welcome pack better, how we interact with people, uh, what the emails look like and everything. So I think it's about building on that and making sure that we are not just doing things that are good for large charities and medium charities. We want to make this work for all size charities, ones that are kind of 
very small, time poor, voluntary led entirely. So I suppose this is a kind of open question of like, what do you want from us? How can we help you? What more can we do? How can we understand trustees better? How can we kind of build on that? And how can we almost help the public understand uh, the role of small charities and sort of what, how we, the commission, are working with small charities to make that happen and, and to show that the kind of public trust that people should have in small charities, that these that charities are kind of run well and doing good things and how can we kind of help tell that story of impact and the vital impact that they have. So I say that's very much a question for you guys and I'm really happy to kind of have a discussion of what we could do because... I think we are uh, on a bit of a journey in the commission. So our current strategy ends next year and we are writing the new strategy at the minute. And as I keep saying, it is vital that we are a regulator for all size charities and not just thinking about those kind of really large charities or the kind of bigger end. We are really keen that uh, our work fits all sizes of charities and kind of is workable for everybody. So really keen to kind of hear your thoughts, views, musings, general general thoughts and their uh, feelings about it all. Let me unmute myself as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Holly. That was really interesting. Very interesting to know that you're a chair of a small charity yourself. I did not know that. That gives you a unique insight, perhaps, into some of the challenges and certainly empathise with spending an hour on the phone to the bank. I saw a few, <laughs> I saw a few faces sort of like, oh, yes. Yes, I have to maintain my professional face when I'm in the meetings with UK Finance, unfortunately, and not just produce forms and rant to them. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. um, Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, we... We talked sort of loosely about a few of the themes that we might cover um, in, in the session today. And I think you've given you've given a good kind of overview of some of those already. And I'm really I'm really interested to sort of dive straight into your question on that last slide, actually, which is, you know, what can the commission do for smaller organizations? Um, we obviously have lots of them on the call today. So I think I'm just going to start us off, actually, by just kind of opening the floor to some initial questions. Um, we did have some that came through for you um, that I can ask on people's behalf, um, but I'll, I'll make sure that the people who are in the room now uh, get to ask their questions. So opening up then to any thoughts or questions that you might have, um, if you could use the raise hand function, which is if you go to the bottom of Zoom and go on to reactions and click that, you'll see an, a button that says raise hand. So if you've got a question or a suggestion or a thought to kick us off with, please do. You can raise, if you've got your video on, feel free to raise your actual human hand as well, if that's easier. <laughs> I can start us off with one of our questions. Oh, Ellie. Go ahead, Ellie. This might not be relevant at all, but I was just wondering if there was any like capacity for the charity com commission to be involved with like trustee recruitment or like helping charities to recruit new trustees. Because I know that we have struggled particularly to recruit for like diversity on our board. Um, and there are some good organizations out there doing that, but we, we, we had real trouble with that as a tiny organization for a rare disease that no one's ever heard of. Um, and I know other organizations that have had similar. So I'm interested in, you know, if you're sort of developing to be this sort of hub for trustees, if there was an opportunity there to help encourage people to take the step into being a trustee. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely something we're interested in. I think the kind of what are the barriers to recruitment is something that we are really interested in. So I don't think it's enough for us to say, be more diverse, get diverse people on the board because it's too, it's almost too simplistic, isn't it? Like, why aren't people becoming trustees? Why is it difficult? So in our research program, we do ask questions about where do people go to find their trustees? 
and unsurprisingly it's often their friends uh, that you know do people use social media and things like that so I think one of part of our campaign next year is going to be what is trusteeship so actually really selling that kind of the skills you can get from being a trustee that actually as a sort of school leaver as somebody you know trying in the job market it's it's a win-win right you can do something great for that charity but actually selfishly you can get really good skills and do good things for yourself as well so I think we're hoping to kind of promote the value of being a trustee over the next year it should be great but then as you say in the my charity commission account as a one-stop shop I think our vision is that we wouldn't be the place that that trusteeships are kind of advertised but we would be able to link to organizations like getting on board and things where people could find them so if they did come to us it's a lot easier rather than coming to us and it's at the minute a bit of a dead end because it, it's not there so yeah I think I think it's a really interesting area and definitely the kind of um diversity of sort of protected characteristics but skills background across different size charities is something that we're really interested in because if you go back to sort of like business the business argument that it makes sense to have the skills of everybody to be the best run charity stroke business you can be then it makes sense in a charity as well so I think definitely over the next year is something that we're really keen to kind of push that and, as a message. Great yeah I think more awareness sounds great. Thanks Ellie. Mike? I suppose to continue on that, as we're talking about diversity of trustees, and I have to say, I have to admit I'm a trustee recruiter, so I know how to recruit trustees, but I'm really surprised that the Charity Commission didn't or doesn't ask questions about trustee diversity in the annual return. Most trustees, as you all know, look like me, older, white, male, cis, hetero, well-educated, middle-class, blah, 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 that sort of stuff. Why isn't the Charity Commission asking simple questions in our annual return? It's a, it's a good question. And one, unsurprisingly, we get asked quite a lot. And I think we did consider it. So we obviously have the Taken on Trust report from 2017, which is quickly becoming out of date as time passes on. And we would hope is kind of... Uh, a better picture than it was and obviously that report also doesn't cover everything we would want it to cover now were we doing it again i think the reason the reason we didn't put it in the annual return is one that it's it is filled in by one person from the charity and therefore there is a question now my kind of personal argument is like the census gets filled in by one person in a household so there is kind of arguments for and that against I think a lot as well with a lot of small charities it wouldn't give us data that we could publish because of the the small numbers of people and the identifiable characteristics in there so and I don't think personally that the annual return is the kind of golden bullet I think there are other ways of doing it and it's definitely something that I'm super keen that we do uh, but it just isn't in the annual return. Mike would you like to share your response? I suppose disappointed is my, is my response um, I mean, I think Holly's point about filling in census is, is, is very well said, and it could have been, you know, I'm chair of a charity, uh, but I've been trustee of other charities, and I've been chief exec, and you could give basic information about your trustees, even if it was optional questions around all those protected characteristics, even if you only filled in a few in. The problem is we don't have the data. And therefore, as a trustee recruiter and getting on board, say the same thing, trustees unlimited say the same thing. And I know NCBO say the same thing. We don't know where we're missing, so we can't target. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing. And I mean, Holly, I see you, 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 you're, you're agreeing with me. It's just a shame. I think it was an opportunity missed. I will and, say and no I more. And we talk to kind of Penny at getting on board a lot and we hear from her, you know, that they're bidding for funding for things. And actually the argument being given by funders is, well, you don't have baseline data. So what we definitely don't want is to be the kind of barrier to improving this. So I am totally aware that we have a role to play in improving that. And I'm hoping that we can fulfill our role at some point soon. <laughs> 
Thanks for that question, Mike, and thanks, Holly. Um, I might put in one of the questions that came to us actually that relates to this, which is something that I've seen come up a lot in the sector when talking about trustees of smaller organizations in particular, where there's often quite a lot more responsibility operationally than when you're a trustee of a larger organization that has a paid staff team. Um, and, and that is the, the question of whether it's ever gonna be possible to pay board members to pay trustees in particular, I think that would benefit smaller organizations and perhaps address some of the inequities that we see in, in sort of trustee uh, roles. Is that, some, is that a conversation that happens within the commission? Is, is that something that's on the agenda, would you say? So I would say we definitely believe in the fact that a trusteeship is a voluntary position and should remain a voluntary position. But I think it's important to flag that trustees can be paid now. So, yes, you should come to the commission for um, sign off of that above a certain threshold. But if as a small charity or any charity you feel that by paying somebody it would fill that gap, it can be done now. So we did some uh, sessions last year in trustees week with getting on board and some of our operational staff just going through the process of that. So I think there's something for us to do to almost tell that story a bit better and explain it a bit better because um, we that it can be done and this is how you do it and this is the process and things like that. I think the other part that we're really keen to stress and we're hope and we're sort of looking to update our guidance later in the year is around the difference between paying people and expenses. So we hear a lot from people where everybody around a trustee board goes, oh, well, I'm not going to claim expenses for that. No, I, or well, I don't claim expenses. Then the person that desperately needs to claim expense, the expenses sort of goes, oh, oh no, me neither. And then they drop out of being a trustee because they, they can't fulfill their role or they're not getting childcare paid for by expenses. So I think it's really important that we, A, are very clear about the process of payment for trustees and the reasons behind that, and B, really stress that claiming for expenses is a completely legitimate use of charitable funds. And it is not a bad thing to claim expenses. You know, that is exactly what you should be doing. And if, it, if that helps release some of those barriers and gets more people, A, to be part of the board, but also to stay part of the board. I think, again, what we hear a lot is that people recruit new diverse trustees, but then actually they they don't feel part of the discussion and, or they're not able to keep going, so they drop out. So I think being really clear on expenses is important, but I, I don't foresee that we, we are anywhere close to saying that trustees could routinely be paid. Yeah, it's a mindset shift for this for us, a lot of us in the sector, I think, on that expenses point. Yes. And um, that's really interesting. I think now that you mentioned that, I do remember that session with getting on board about when it's appropriate to pay trustees. And it'd be great to see more of that information out there. I'll certainly yeah. be looking into that as well. And yeah, agree that it would be great to, to push that. Certainly can think of some small charities who would be able to make use of that option. Um, Okay, have we got any more questions or points uh, of discussion for Holly Wayne? Hello, Holly. Um, you're just talking about um, strategy coming towards the end of your strategy and setting up the new one. I was just wondering in terms of evaluation, how you've evaluated your success and then putting a bit of a human face on the commission, like what's gone well and what hasn't. Yeah, interesting question and, and, and a very live question for us that, as you say, we are in the process of saying what what has gone well, where have, where has that impact kind of been? And I think actually the last five years has been a real journey for the Commission and really changing how we regulate. So we're a much more kind of risk based regulator now, our sort of systems are much more embedded in uh, what we do. I think we've also switched from being um, a very black and white regulator. So I've only been at the commission two years. So some of this is kind of what, what they tell me it was happening, but very black and white. We, we regulate and we do nothing else. And so therefore things around uh, the diversity of trustees, for example, as we've just been talking about, I think at the beginning of the strategy, weren't discussion points on the table as much because 
it's not a regular, you know, it is not prescriptively laid out in legislation. So I think actually what what is go what has been a real success for the commission is almost just people knowing a bit more about that kind of thing, being a bit softer, being a bit more advice giving, um, which has allowed us to sort of spread into the sector a little bit more. And as I say, being more agile in terms of our risk profiling means that actually the cases that we bring are stronger, they're better. You know, we have really high success rates of charities. I think the revitalizing trust program, so where we have uh, dormant accounts where charities aren't spending the money and effectively we repurpose that in the sector has been hugely impactful um, and, and really brilliant. And it, we have an interesting setup in the in the commission in that we obviously have a chair at the top and so we have a new chair now under the old strategy and the new chair will set the new strategy and so actually seeing that shift in terms of as I say that kind of softer regulator and how we are giving advice and we are encouraging people to kind of come to us and ask for advice I think is a really interesting shift um, and probably one that will take the sector quite a long time to get used to I think um, that we're saying to people like just give us a call and ask is quite a different message. Thanks Wayne. So just a reminder for everyone then, we're sort of posing this question to you as representatives from small charities. What do we need more of from the Commission? Thinking about your role in your organisation or perhaps when you were starting out, um, what did you feel that you needed more of? Um, Caroline. Hi, um, thank you. So far, the trustee bit's been very interesting. Um, and yes, I agree with people needing more help to find trustees. Um, I clerk for two charities who, and we need, chari need trustees for both. Um, I would love them to be more diverse. They're not, they're all white middle class. Um, we do have some women, which is a bonus, <laughs> but I'd love to see some more diversity. Um, and they're all quite old as well, to be fair, which again is, you know, we need, younger people interested um but that aside I, one of the things that i when you changed from being the charity commission as a, a sort of website and went into the government website and suddenly the search facility turned from something where i could search within the charity commission for something specific it turned to something where i'd get i get reams of information about everything from the government and I have to pick through it to try and find the Charity Commission information. And that is for a, a clerk of two very small charities <laughs> who just wants to be able to find the information <laughs> that's about that big, probably, the information. But that's all I need. <laughs> um, going to a search facility that suddenly gives me the whole of the government is just pointless. I, I, I would so much prefer you to go back to where you were before where it was just the charity commission and I searched within it and wow I got results <laughs> I think, so I think my digital time. colleagues my digital colleagues would also like it because the battles they have to try and get through uh government websites are impossible for everybody um but I would say I think hopefully my charity commission account will almost sort of solve that because as you log into your account all that information, it will effectively be like the website plus within my charity commissioner's account. So you will be able to search for stuff just within that our kind of enclave of government rather than as you say, having all the bits. So I make no pretense that this is happening quickly or next week or as soon as you would like Caroline, but hopefully that is the plan that effectively as you say, you won't have to search yeah. through. It will all be there and searchable much better. And almost hopefully we will have preempted based on where you are in terms of your year as a charity, your term, your role, your skills, that what you need will be kind of at the top sort of thing is, is the dream. <laughs> Oh, that sounds absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks for your question, Caroline. Got a question from Rosie in the chat. Rosie, I'm not sure if I'm fully getting what you want to ask. So, oh, hang on. She's been kicked out and coming back in. Let's just wait for Rosie to rejoin.
Hi, Rosie. Welcome back. I was just reading your question in the chat. If you're happy to, would you mind unmuting and asking your question? I just, I'm not sure if I fully understood it and I don't want to get it wrong. Oh, hi there. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I think what I'm trying to ask is when you, um, quite a good way sometimes to find potential new sources of funding is to look at charities' accounts. And obviously they're updated on the charity commission and we can see when the, um, you know, it publishes how many days late it was, which is helpful for, you know, due diligence. And it publishes the start and end year date. It'd just be great to know <laughs> the date it was submitted. If it, that was on a search function, I would be better able to plan my time to go and ask, right, that charity's republished its account. So I'm going to now have a good look at it and see if... I can identify any other sources of funding from my charity from it mm -hmm. or what they've been up to in their good practice, because I think that would be quite a helpful one, uh, whether it's like an advanced search function that I'm not currently aware of. Um, I don't know, but um, certainly I keep looking. I'm like, oh, no, they're out again in June, but I have I keep looking too early. So um, hopefully I think that might be useful for a range of organisations when trying to identify potential funders. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds really interesting. I think I think on data generally, the ability to search accounts and the register and things like that is not great at the minute. I think is an, an sort of an underestimate of how bad it is, and it's not great for us in the commission either. We have equal challenges searching it. It is it's not very user friendly. And one of the things that will be key in the new strategy sort of from now into the new strategy is use of data. I mean, as with all sectors, data is kind of king really. And at the minute we gather lots of data in from the sector and then we kind of go, oh that's nice and we keep it to ourselves and we don't let anybody else see it. And and but because it's not really that accessible to us either, even we don't use it to its full potential. So actually we're having a real push around more open data and making accounts and the register more searchable. And that's good for the sector, but it's also good for the public and making public trust and the transparency of charities that actually if they can see that charities are doing good things with their money they can see the impact but also they can see the ones that are not doing good things with their money um and that kind of leveling up of everybody if with the how transparent they are with their data is great so uh that's a really great example which i've written down of where we can do something simple that would make a big difference but as i say core to us is just making our data a bit more accessible so that all those kind of clunky bits of you've been able to find different charities nearby in your sector etc cetera, etc cetera, you should be able to access that much more simply thanks for that question rosie anyone else have a question or a uh, a response to this this like this question of how the commission could better support small charities mike I don't have a response. I've got something else mm -hmm. if nobody's coming in as well. I actually want to praise the Commission and uh, often I see the sector and, and the Commission at loggerheads there as well. The easy read guides, absolutely brilliant, really useful. I remember being in a meeting with Getting On Board and the Commission during Small Charities, uh, during Trustees Week a couple of years ago when one of the commissioners said some of the guidance is longer than a Shakespeare play and we all nodded and, and sighed and the rest of it. And then the easy read guides came out. I like the fact that there are a small number of them. I think it's now eight. Please, please, please do not make 30 small easy read guides because that will put trustees off. Focus on what we need to know as trustees. I use them in trustee training that I run regularly. I use them with my own board. I've used them, recommended them to other trustees of other boards I've been on, but not too many of them because it will, the, it will just get lost in the detail. I see you nodding and I'm sure everybody understands this as well. The ones we've got are really, really, really good. Let me feed back to the commission here now live. They are really good. I like them, so do other people, not too many. Thank you, Mike. What I might do just to get some, some comments coming through in the chat is just ask you all to have a think about wh what you think one thing that the Commission could do to better support smaller charities. 
So perhaps just have a think about that for a minute. Think about your situation currently in terms of when you need support and guidance, perhaps at the beginning of your journey when you might have needed some signposting um, and just drop in the chat what one thing you would have found particularly helpful or what one thing you would find really helpful um, at, at this point in your organization's journey. Something that came up um, in kind of conversations around this prior to the meeting was around how we connect small charities. So when a, when a new small charity is registered on the charity commission, is there a way of signposting them to other small charities in their geography? You know, can we say, can we, can there be some sort of automated process whereby they get an email saying, congratulations, you're now a charity, your local CVS is X, here are the other organisations registered within a 10 or 20 mile radius, um, because what I hear very, very often in, in my work with small charities is the isolation and loneliness of working in a small charity and that feeling of really not knowing where on earth to go, what on earth to do now. Um, so the, the, there seems to be a real craving for signposting, which I appreciate might be quite difficult because things become out of date quite quickly. You've already mentioned, Holly, the great partnerships that are happening with the likes of getting on board. But do you think there's the capacity within the commission to do more signposting, to be showing smaller charities what's out there for them and connecting them to each mm. other? Uh, Caroline. Yeah. The the main thing I remember when I first became a clerk, which is a long time ago now, um, but the loneliness. You are a very lonely person as a clerk to trustees. You work from home mostly. Um, you go to meetings and things like that. Um, but you don't have any colleagues. Your trustees are all volunteers. They give their time when they can. Um, but they work mostly. Um, if they're retired, then they're off gallivanting most of the time. Um, <laughs> Um, but as so as a clerk, you, you sit in your home office in a very lonely environment. And actually what you'd really like to be able to do is just find another clerk of a similar charity and have a chat and ask a few questions. And what do you do with so and so and bounce off them? And I mean, I, I did find a, an educational trust forum, which I'm part of and I'm very grateful for because we do bounce off each other. But there must be thousands of clerks out there who feel like I do <laughs> and would love a little forum where we can bounce questions silly ones if they're silly then no questions silly but do you know what I mean find a little community of people who are doing the same job who might be totally different charities but actually we all have very similar things to do on a daily basis and just yeah someone to ask <laughs> mm. Yeah, so there's something there around connection, isn't there? And Holly, do you think that there's this, there's the is is that within the charity commission's remit to be trying to connect the sector more to enable the knowledge sharing? I don't know. To be honest, I think it's an interesting question. I think there's something like your idea, Vic, of almost like giving people the tools to do it themselves. Like, mm. where are these people, and where are the connections can be made, and then the infrastructure organisations kind of being able to use that data I think it's it's sort of knowing who plays what role and I think it's almost like our role is having the data but allowing that data and information to be used better rather than um making those connections and kind of bringing the sector together more I think mm. thank you Holly there's a question from Louise in the chat which we'll finish on because we're just about coming up to time Louise has asked are there better ways of reporting charities that are straying from guidance, perhaps from members of the public, members of staff, and possibly ways of the Charity Commission following up positively with trustees who don't know all the guidance? At the moment, it seems there is a serious incident report, and that's just for trustees, some of whom may be complicit or unaware. Yeah, I think 
it, it's it's really difficult. I would say our contact center is always there for kind of advice. And sometimes it might be actually if you're um, a kind of member of staff or something and you want to almost sort of suggest a different ways that you can kind of send somebody guidance and, and help them understand a little bit more of why what they're doing is wrong and, and things like that. And that's obviously more difficult for members of the public, although again, members of the public can still phone our advice line and uh, contact centre and get information like that. But I think I think it is really difficult. And I don't I don't want to kind of uh, pretend that we would actively do something. You know, we have a risk based model in order so that we can use our resources to prioritise the most serious harm um, and fix that. However, we're also aware that often the kind of low level harm becomes the most serious harm and therefore you have to make those changes early on. Um, so I would say our contact centre is there. There is something about our campaigns, like getting that message out there. We are the regulator of charity. If you have concerns, come to us. And I think there's something on us to make that point uh, well. And also in the My Charity Commission account, which I say, I know I'm making it sound like this kind of golden bullet is going to fix all problems. But I think the fact that everyone will have a login and everybody in the charity can have access to that information a bit more easily means that everybody will be more skilled up. I think Lorna's question about everybody being able to do a bit more because everybody has a login, I think is really important because actually that's about getting advice and doing things and, and those kind of things. Um, and Lorna's just had a chat about including CEOs to help as well. And I think, yes, that is about us having those connections with kind of Akiva and the sector organisations to say, look, this is really important and these are all the things that will make a difference. And if, if the sector is better and stronger then that helps the public be more engaged and the public trust the sector more and uh, allows the sector to kind of and small charity to keep doing this really impactful really vital work and, and at no more vital time than now I think we there are so many examples of why now is so challenging for charities because they are squeezed in resources but they're the amount that we're being asked to do is massive and so I think actually just making all this other stuff easier and us being there as a kind of backstop to say we will help you and as you say it doesn't always need to be a serious instant report it can just be advice and guidance through our contact centre we will do what we can to make your lives more straightforward more easier and to kind of keep things running so that small charities can keep doing what they do best. Well, that's a, a very nice and apt moment to draw to a close, I think. Um, thanks very much, Holly, for joining us. Appreciate it. And thank you to all of you who've joined and shared your thoughts and ideas. Um, sounds like there's some exciting and interesting things on the horizon, Holly, and uh, look forward to seeing those play out. Um, just reading the chat to see whether there's anything else before we go. Caroline's idea is a great one of forming a community if the Commission's remit isn't or the sponsor for this week open to it. Yeah, absolutely. Shirley, do join the session on Friday about the future for infrastructure support for the small charity sector, because that's when there'll be a continuation of this discussion on we need to stay connected, we need to support each other, we need to know who each other are and, and how do we practically do that. So do check out the session that's happening on Friday that Wayne and I will be hosting. But thanks very much, everyone, for coming today. Holly, thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.